All right. Hello, CS16. Hopefully this is actually recording. I will find out soon enough if it isn't. Uh, it is supposed to be April 9th, but it's not for me. I'm recording this earlier. Uh, but yeah, let's get started with lecture three. Uh, let's look at this first eye clicker question. I uh, don't really know how to do this. I guess you should pause and think about what the answer should be, and then we'll talk about it. So assuming you've done that, uh, most of the time I think people will guess that the answer should be 0 0.1. But in fact, because of the way that C++ uh, converts its types, it is not. So let me show you what the answer really is by going to the terminal and then eventually coding all this up. So I'm in my code from class folder. Today is supposed to be April 9th, so I'll make a new directory for that day. Uh, 0409, and then cd into that. And I guess I'll make a file called hmm, floats or floating point division. .cpp. Then I'll go and open that up over here. And let's make a main function and include IO stream using namespace. STD. So, back to this. So we declare a variable that's an integer variable and then set a double variable called sum to be 1 over that. So you would expect this to be 0 0.1, right? But the way that C++'s type conversion works, that is not what's happening. So let me see out some, and then just a new line, and now let's go and compile this. So there's the code, here's my terminal, uh, I'll do g++, floating point division.cpp dash o, I'll just call it that one big thing, floating point division, why not? So now I have that to run, floating point division, and the answer is zero. Oh man. So the answer should be A, and let's, let's figure out why. It's because everything on the right-hand side of an equality gets evaluated first before it goes and gets put into the variable on the left-hand side of an equality. So sum itself is a double, but everything over here is an integer being divided. So 1 is an integer itself, i is an integer, and so this is going to perform integer division. And that's not a good thing, that's not what we wanted. So if uh, either side of that division sign had a double on it, then it would have done what we would, what we expected. So it would have returned 0 0.1 there, because then it would have done floating point division. So let me show you this. Let me do C out 1.0 divided by i. Or also, we can do uh, we can cast i itself to be a double by doing the static underscore cast. This makes it a double into a double of uh, i. So now i is really after using this big long function, i is now a double, and so it'll perform double division. So we should see zero and then 0 0.1.1. Hopefully, let's recompile. Spelled C out wrong. All right, so now it's doing what we expected, and that's just because floating point division doesn't happen as often as you would expect. So the answer really is A, even though you want it to be 0 0.1. All right, uh, this is going to be useful when you're uh, working on your lab. Uh, this is just telling the telling C++ how you want your doubles, your floating point numbers, to be uh, printed out. So it's these three lines right here that, that do that kind of thing. So three precision means three decimal places, uh, fixed show point. I guess you should think about what the answer should be before I tell you. Uh, assuming you've done that, let's, let's code this up now. Let's see if I can just copy all of this into a new, new file. 
maybe I'll take most of this. Then I should call this, uh, let's see, double formatting .cpp. I'll paste all this in and why not add a new line for fun? So now we've done the right thing. We've, we've converted i to an integer, so it will print 0 0.1. But how? It's this 3 that's going to make all the difference. So let's, let's compile this using g++, name of the file, dash o, give it what we want it to be called, and let's just call it double formatting by itself. And so it's this three that gives it three decimal places worth of precision. So it's 1.100, so the answer should be D. All right, let's see what happens when we get rid of some of these. Uh, it's possible that you wouldn't need to show a decimal point, like maybe had just a single, like an integer value stored as a double. That's what this show point makes sure it shows a decimal point. Uh, and then this, sometimes with big numbers, it's like, it says like 1 e to the 5 for like 10,000. This gets rid of that. So it makes it show you lots of just digits only, no scientific notation. Uh, so if we were to get rid of the precision mark, it would output with some default amount of precision, which looks like it's 6. All right. So now, let's get into loops. So we, we have a bunch of stuff, and we want to do it a lot. OK? Uh, there are two type, types of loops in C++, for loops and while loops. Uh, for loops are not as similar to Python's for loops as you would expect, which is unfortunate. Uh, they look a bit different. So uh, let us use a for loop to, I guess, let's just print out some stuff. Let's print the numbers from 1 to 10 using a for loop. And then we'll talk about why it's so weird and why it's different. Uh, so in Python, it's usually you're, you're using a for loop to print out, you're, to iterate through something. But uh, for loops look a bit different in C++. It's for int something, int i equals 0, this is a declaration, uh, then you give your condition, i is less than 10, or let's do from 1 to 10, and then you give your increment, we'll say i++, plus plus, and then we'll see out uh, i each time. So this will print 1 to 10, for loops, dot cpp. This will print the numbers from 1 to 10, but why? <laughs> So this first thing is, so it's it goes like this, for uh, initialization, increment, or comparison, sorry, and then uh, increment statement, and then the body is what's inside of the braces, as you would expect. So let's run this, and let me prove to you that it prints out 1 to 10. And then we'll talk about why, why it does that. So here's what's going on. And this is going to be like my whiteboard for these, for these lectures. I have a little uh, mouse that I can draw with. Uh, and apparently I'm logged out. That's fun. But I should be able to still do stuff. All right. So let me make some marks. So we have a for loop. Uh, for, uh, we call it initialization, then comparison, and then increment, and then we uh, execute the body. body. So let me just give these numbers, I guess, one, two, three, four. And we'll talk about the order in which these things happen. So the initialization statement is just setting up the loop, this for loop for us. Notice that there's no list for us to, in, to iterate through. This is just using integers. Uh, 
So we start out with the initialization statement. That's the first thing in the for loop that gets executed. So uh, for loops execute uh, in this order. It's it goes like this. It goes initialization statement. Oh gosh, I don't want to draw again. There we go. Initialization statement. Then check if we want to con check if we can perform the body. We want to execute the body only if the comparison is true. So we'll always check the comparison first. So like we start here saying i equals 1. Is i less than or equal to 10? Yes. So we will execute the body. And if that is true, we'll go and execute the body. And then after the loop, we do this increment statement. And that's what eventually will stop the loop. So let's see here. Increment is meant to eventually stop the loop. OK. So after that, we'll check the increment statement, or we'll do the increment statement, and then keep on checking the comparison and running the body as long as that comparison holds true. So it's kind of this, uh, this kind of way, and that's why it's a loop. I mean, you're going back and you're, you're going in circles. Let me draw arrows here. So this is the true case. So if it was true, two is true. Otherwise, the loop is over. If it's false, we're done with the loop. OK, so that's what a for loop looks like, uh, and that's how it executes. All right, so back to the slides. Let's, let's get a bit fancier now, and let's make a program that calculates the series 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third, all the way to 1 over n, where n is given by the user. And let's just maybe use cn for that. So uh, I can copy most of this. Let's, let's ask the user for a number. Enter n space, maybe. Cn n. And of course, I'll have to declare n if I want to populate it with something. And now we have n. So let's calculate that sum of the series. Uh, back to the slides. So it's 1 plus 1 half all the way up like this. And let's just use a comment to do that. You know what? Better yet, let's make this a function. Eee. So this is a function called calculate sum. And it'll take how many, how far we want to go in this iteration. So it'll take an n, right? Int n. And it'll return this sum, which involves a bunch of non-whole numbers. So it should return a floating point double value. So uh, I want to use some kind of for loop, maybe. And let's see, this might all have to change. And we want to see out sum is, and then calculate sum with n new line. So that's how we'll do this. It'll call this function, and everything should be fine. Uh, OK. So let's say that if n is 1, then it'll just be the first term. If n is 2, it'll be 1 plus 1 half. If n is 3, it'll be 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third. So let's do it like this. Uh, so we'll, we'll want this loop to run n times. So we can do it like this. Or if i starts at 0, it'll be i is less than n. That can be the comparison. All right, so now this loop is definitely going to iterate n times. And we need some kind of uh, variable to hold our result, so I'll call it double res or something and start it out at 0. And I'll just keep on adding this, this kind of division, this new term each time. So add to res, uh, and so if we want to do something like 1 over some number, because that's what always changes. This is really 1 over 1, right? 
add to res the current term of the series we're working on. So uh, that'll just be 1 over i, right? So if i is 1, it's the first iteration, and we want to add 1 over 1. Then in the next iteration, i will be 2, because we do i++. Plus plus. And yeah, plus plus, by the way, uh, adds 1 to i. OK? So res will be, we can add to res 1 over i. And remember that we have to convert one of these things to a double. Let's just do 1.0. It's a bit easier that way. So now this will actually do double division, which was what we wanted. So after this, res will be the correct number of uh, terms in the series. And then we can return back to whoever called this the right answer, res. All right. So let's, let's try running this. G plus plus sum series. Enter n, I don't know, 1, sum is 1. Enter n, I don't know, 5, 2, 1 and a half, 3. What about 0? Sum is 0. Negative numbers, do those work? Yeah, it'll just not ever do the loop. So if uh, i starts out at 1, and we gave a 0 or a negative number, this loop would never start, because loops always test their condition before they execute the body. So the loop would never run. OK? And so yeah, this seems, seems to be good. You can also check for negative numbers if you'd like to do that and just maybe say that was a bad idea. If n is less than or equal to 0, see out, or see error, this is an error now. Please enter a non, or a positive number. And we can end the program with an error code of 1 maybe, because it's bad. And we need C standard library for this. All right. And so now when we run this, it'll be like, oh no, you gave us a bad number, instead of actually calculating the sum of the series. OK. Sorry, I made a mistake. Uh, I put, I used functions to, to calculate this sum of series before I actually introduced them. That's a job for the next lecture, actually. So let me go back and change this to what it needs to be. And I'll put this right after. Uh, my mistake in the actual lecture. So hopefully I can just splice all that in. So pay no attention to the calculate sum function. Uh, here is where we'll put all the all the work again. So just instead of returning it just calculates something and puts it in res and it's still n. Uh, and the result is res. So this does the exact same thing, uh, just everything's happening in main right now. I will introduce functions in the next lecture. So you got a bit of a sneak peek there. And yeah, so everything's still working just fine. All right. Those are for loops. Uh, while loops are exactly like you would expect in, uh, in Python or any other language that you've been introduced to. So let's do the same thing. Uh, for loops in C++, loops in any language, they're interchangeable, so you can do the same thing in both. Maybe it's just a bit easier to use one over the other. For loops are really good for like this kind of incrementation kind of stuff. Like I want to do, I want to go from here to here, from 1 to 10, something like that. Whereas while loops get a bit, uh, it's slightly more tedious to do that. So while something is true, we'll do something. And that's what a while loop will look like. So again, counting from 1 to 10, while, actually, we want to start at 1, right? Start at 1. And then while, let me just delete all this, why not? While i is less than or equal to 10, 
we want to first print out i, because we want to print from 1 to 10. And then, no more adding. we want to add 1 to i, i++. plus plus. So you see how we kind of had to do some of the stuff ourselves when we were using while loops instead. That is one thing that for loops are slightly better for. They keep all that right together. While loops. So this will also print from 1 to 10, assuming I didn't do anything wrong. While loops. So there we go. Printing from 1 to 10, just fine. And let's talk about why. So uh, with a while loop, again, let's do this kind of thing with numbers and stuff. So while we have some kind of comparison happening. Comparison. So every time that comparison is true, we'll output, or we'll do whatever the body says to do. We'll execute the body once. And then we'll come back and keep testing the comparison. So it's a bit simpler to talk about how while loops execute. So while loops execute like this. First check the comparison. Then if it's true, we'll do the body. And then we'll come back and keep checking the comparison. If it's ever false, we're done with the loop again. End of loop. So yeah, while loops are a bit faint, or a bit simpler, uh, and they have their merits. Oops. I don't know why this is happening. Oh, sorry. It's because this is full screen. There we go. All right. So those are while loops. Now do while loops. These look a bit different. So uh, let's see. A do a while loop looks like this. It's It's got a do and then a while at the end of it, which is a bit odd. Uh, do while something. And also semicolon. So this should actually do the same thing if I'm not crazy. Uh, and the only difference between a do while loop and a while loop is whether or not there's the order of executing the body and the comparison. That, that makes all the difference. Oops. Okay, so we're printing from 1 to 10, but not in the way that we are used to. So do, then comes the body. Oops, I can't spell. Body. Then comes the comparison. There, sorry, with a while before that. and then a semicolon. So now, I don't know, just for similarity's sake, I'll keep one as the comparison and two as the body. And so do while loops execute like this. They do the body first, regardless of whether the comparison's true. That's why like, you write the body before the comparison. And so then it'll immediately go and check the comparison. And if that's true, it'll go back and do the body true, and if false, then the loop is over, end of loop. And so really, the only difference for a do while loop is this kind of order, where check the comparison first, then do the body, or do the body at least once, and then check the comparison. So body always gets executed at least once in a do while loop. This is sometimes what you want. All right. So now let's let's get into drawing some stuff. Let's draw a, a bunch of stars in the form of a square. All right. Uh, yeah. So this is going to involve. Uh, nested loops, and I'll use nested for loops here. So the the kind of strategy that we want to use here will look like this. So uh, let's see here. 
let me make sure that I am doing what I wanted to do in the right order. Yeah. So, okay, back here. We want to do this kind of thing. We want to do draw square. Maybe five. So we'll get that from a command line as a command line argument. That's no problem. And we wanted to print out a bunch of stars. There, that's easier. Uh, can I just copy this? Let's find out. Ooh. Mm, maybe. Ooh, yes. Yes. Okay, cool. And the reason we need two loops, or the reason it makes the most sense to use two loops, is because we can keep track of. We can use one loop to keep track of which line we're on. So, like line one, line two, line three. And then, inside of that, we can have another loop. That's totally valid to keep track of how many stars we've printed out on that line. So, let's say I'm on line one in my outer for loop, and then I want to start printing five stars, one, two, three, four, five, using my inner for loop, and then I'll go do the next iteration. I'm on the next line, another loop. So this is loops inside of loops, and let me just code this up so that it makes a lot more sense. So we want to do something like draw square five, so let's, let me just copy all this maybe. Draw square, I think we're calling it like that. No underscores, yeah, draw square. So I'll call it draw square dot cpp like that. Okay. So we want to use command line arguments. So let us do this. And then we also want to convert it to so. So let's make sure we actually have a command line argument, right? If uh, argc is unequal to two, error usage is whatever the name of the program was, which is in argv zero and then space, like number, maybe space, n for, for a number, new line. Okay, and then we'll exit if that is a problem. All right, so now, assuming we have an actual number, or at least we have something in argv uh, of one, we'll get it, we'll say it, uh, n, is whatever argv of 1 was, that's the argument that we were given, and we need to convert this, because right now it's just a string, using a to i, and yeah, so now we have n to work with, and that's actually, for both of the loops that we're going to use, that's how much we want. So if we want to print five lines, and inside of those five lines we want to print five stars, so five by five. I'm going to do an outer loop to keep track of which of line we're on. All right, so int i is zero. i is less than n, I guess. i plus plus. So this will do something n times. We'll iterate n times, keeping track of which line we're on. And inside of this, I want to do another for loop. So now. I'm on a line, and I need to print five. I need to print n stars. So I'll go ahead and I'll iterate again n times using a different variable, of course, because I don't want to overwrite that. Int j is zero. J is less than n. J plus plus. And so then I'll print out a single star. Now I just need to print out a single star, and I'll do it like this, just a star. And bam, let's see what this does now. So if I get my, can I get all this all together? Yeah, there we go. So G plus plus, draw square. So if I do draw square with something weird, like negative one, or I guess not negative one, but if I give it no arguments, it'll say, ah, oh, I gotta use some arguments. 
And all right, if I give it draw square five. Oh man, it just printed a bunch of stars. It, it'll print 25 stars. This is no problem. But we forgot to end the line. So once we're done printing our five stars on a single line, we need to end that line, right? We forgot this, this whole. No, oh, no, just dropped my notes. We forgot the whole new line bit. Oh gosh. Uh, we'll deal with that later. All right, so yeah, we just have to print a new line right here. We oops, wrong way. Can't forget that. So at the end of each line, we'll just print a new line, and that will that'll solve our problem. We're done with the line. Print a new line. And I think once we do that, then we should be able to uh, get draw square five. To work just fine. Yeah, so this is five by five now. Awesome. And so that is a, an example of using nested for loops. Now, say we didn't want to draw a square, we wanted to draw a triangle. Think about this for a second, pause the video, whatever. Think about which one of these options, what line would we need to change to get this to draw just a triangle and not a box each time. Okay? So I will assume you've thought about that. And let's go back to this. So we're saying that this line, this first line, keeps track of which line we're on. We still want to print five lines. That shouldn't change. But depending on which line we're on, we need to print a certain number of stars now. We don't want to just print the same number. We want to print a different number each time. So this loop keeps track of how many stars we're printing. So we'll have to change this. So the answer should be B. All right? And it looks like I forgot a space after my stars. Stars and spaces. So let's change that. And then also copy all this over to draw a triangle. And we'll change this one line. So if we want to draw a triangle, we have to change how many stars we want to print. Not N anymore. Let's think about it. If I'm on line 1, uh, let's see how much I can copy of this. This would be really cool if I could do this. Ooh, I think I can. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if that worked. Yeah. Oh, this is awesome. All right, so if I'm on line one, I want to print one star. If I'm on line two, I want to print two stars. And when I'm on line one, N is, or I is zero. And I want to print one star. So i equals zero, one star. When I'm on line two, i is equal to two, I want to print, no, sorry, i is equal to one, and I want to print two stars. So if you can see the pattern here, it's always going to be i plus one stars on each line. So instead of n stars, I want to print i plus one stars. And so now, this is really cool, we're using an iteration variable from an outer loop to control the inner loop. That's pretty cool. All right, so let's compile this. Draw a triangle. Draw a triangle five, and that is exactly what we wanted. So we just had to change one line, how many stars we wanted to print out. So, of course, not every loop that you write the first time is going to do the right thing. And there are infinite loops, definitely. Take a look at these and see which ones you think are going to be infinite loops that will just iterate forever and the program will never end. All right, let's go through them one by one. So here is a loop that uh, starts at 0, right? Y starts at 0. We're checking whether or not y is less than 10 and doing y minus minus. So just in the order of things, we'll start y out at 0. y starts out being 0. I'll draw a big box for y, so I'm going to change it a lot. Oops. Starts out being 0. And is it less than 10? Yeah, 0 is less than 10. So I will do, I will output this line, 
print forever, output some stuff, and then I'll change y to be y minus minus. So that means y becomes y minus 1. So instead of 0, now it's negative 1. And you can see the problem here. So is negative 1 less than 10? Oh, yeah, it is. And so I'll make, I'll print out, make it negative 2. And this will go on forever and ever, and the program will never end. So this is definitely an infinite loop. All right, now how about this one? Oh, this is fun because for loops, for loops are interesting in that you don't have to give the initialization, you don't have to give any of these things, you can just separate, use blank spaces in between semicolons. So this only has an increment, because it's using this as an initialization statement, it didn't need one, so it didn't give one. And there's no comparison, which means it'll always evaluate to true. So when you don't give a comparison to a for loop, it's like giving it as true. So, if you don't provide a comparison to a for loop, it'll always execute the body, unless you break out of the loop, which is something you can do. So this will also print forever. It'll, y will start out being zero, and it'll print, do print forever, then Y will be one, it'll be print forever, because this is always just checking for true, which is always true. All right, how about this one? Y starts out being zero. No initialization. Is Y less than 10? Yes. Okay. That's fine. And then we expect it to do Y plus plus. But this is where the lack of braces really gets you. Because there is a semicolon right here. You should code this up and try it. This is the entire for loop. It's like saying this. So, I don't know. For, oh gosh, is the same as for, oh gosh, for y less than 10, empty body. So, that thing that you expected, y plus plus, is not actually the body anymore. There's an empty body, and so y will never actually get updated. So this line of code never gets visited because this for loop is busy executing its empty body. This is why it's very important to always use your braces. All right, what about this one? Y equals zero, Y is less than 10, print forever. Why does it print forever? Because Y never gets updated. It always stays zero, and so it'll never be uh, greater than or equal to 10, which would stop the loop. And then finally, while y equals to y plus plus, so you'd eventually expect this to be, okay, y equals zero, yeah, it's, well, it's not equal to two yet, but eventually it will be after a few iterations. And this is a problem because this is not a comparison, this is an its assignment. So y equals two as an assignment, of course, tests for that, tests if y is equal Two, y equals two sets y to be two, and the result, and uh, the result. So what the comparison sees is two. So whenever you have an assignment, the right hand side of the assignment is the result of the assignment. If you ever use it in this kind of way, it's going to use this, and it'll get, it'll evaluate the statement to be two. And 2 is a true integer, right? The only false integers are 0, is 0. And so this will only be, this will, this will iterate forever because y is 0. Is y equal to 2? Well, this evaluates to 2, which is true. So y is set to 2 in here. y will be set to 3. Come back to the comparison. y gets to be set to 2 again. And then it just keeps on going 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3 just because this assignment statement should have been in a comparison statement. And y equals 2 evaluates to 2, and 2 is going to be converted into a Boolean value here, which is going to be true. That is a long-winded way of saying this is an infinite loop. So these are all examples of infinite loops. And then with that, uh, here's a fun little uh, example of using for loops to do something called brute force search. So we can just try all possibilities. That's what it means to do brute force search. search. Try every possibility. Whee. 
So, brute force. Try every possibility. Okay. So here's the statement. Horses cost $10, pigs cost $3, and rabbits are only 50 cents. So we want to buy some of these animals. A farmer buys 100 animals for $100. How many, an how many of each animal did he buy? And so we'll try all the possibilities. We'll just try to get, uh, try to buy 100 horses, 100 pigs, 100 rabbits. Like, just try every possible combination of horses, pigs, and rabbits. And we can do that using nested loops. Uh, I will show you how. And if we ever get to a state where we ended up buying exactly 100 things and we ended up paying exactly $100, then we will have found a correct solution to this, uh, to this problem. So let's make a new file and let's, let's walk through this. So mm, bruteforce.cdp. OK. So let's say I have, uh, I don't know. Let's try this. So I'm going to try up to 100. Let's see, do I always have to buy each animal? No, I could have zero horses if I wanted to. So for int horses, so this will get tr keep track of the number of horses. Horses equals zero, I could have up to 100, right? Horses less than or equal to 100. Horses plus plus. Uh, so this tries, tries zero to 100 horses. And then inside of that, I'll also try to buy a bunch of pigs. So again, I could buy zero pigs or 100 pigs. So for int pigs equals zero, pigs less than or equal to 100, pigs plus plus. Try zero to 100 pigs. And so now I have to try a bunch of rabbits. And if you're, if any of you are like, good at statistics, you will notice that this problem only actually has two degrees of freedom. We don't need another loop. Because as soon as we know how many horses and pigs that we bought, because the number of animals adds up to 100, we then immediately know how many rabbits we bought. So rabbits. And we had to have bought 100 minus horses minus pigs, right? It's whatever's left that makes it 100, right? Because horses plus pigs plus rabbits equals 100. So we immediately know how many rabbits we bought. And so it's possible that we bought like 100 horses and 100 pigs, so that's, that wouldn't be a satisfying solution because then rabbits would be negative. So the only other time uh, this would make sense is if rabbits is, I don't know, it's got to be greater than or equal to zero, right? That's, that's, a, that's something that needs to be true for this to be correct. And then also, uh, we want the, like, we have to keep track of uh, whether or not we're spending exactly $100. So the price, we'll have to find the price. So it's possible we have a satisfying solution. Now let's check the price. So the price is going to be a double, right? Because it's going to involve decimals. Uh, so horses cost. Let's copy this so that I can see it. Price equals horses times 10 plus pigs times 3 plus rabbits times 50.5. Uh, so there's the price. And now, if the price is equal to 100, $100, I'll just use decimals for fun, if it's exactly $100, then we found a solution. Print it out. So we'll have to print out the number of horses. So we bought that many horses, and then maybe a space, that many pigs, that many rabbits, and then maybe this is the last line, so we'll print a new line, 
and then they'll just keep on trying these. It'll try a bunch of different combinations of horses and pigs from 0 to 100, figure out how many rabbits we needed to buy to make that add to 100, make sure that we bought non-negative numbers of rabbits, and then check the price. So once we get into here, like if all of these things are true, we bought uh, exactly 100 animals, we bought those 100 animals for exactly $100, right? So if we got here, we bought exactly 100 animals because we checked that this kind of statement made sense. Horses plus pigs plus rabbits equals 100. And then we also checked that the price was $100. And so this is a solution. So it'll just try a bunch of these things. And there's not that many. There's like, I don't know, 10,000 things to try. And this this will run pretty quickly. Uh, and it'll print out all the satisfying solutions. So let's see which ones there are. G++, brute force. All right, it looks like here are two solutions. So I could have bought zero horses, 20 pigs, and 80 rabbits. So it adds up to 100. Right? And so let's just check this to make sure everything's right. So let's go into Python, because why not? Pigs cost $3, so 20 times 3 plus rabbits, 80 rabbits times 50 cents. Cool, that was 100. And then also we could have bought 5 horses, so 5 times $10, so we spent $50 on horses. Uh, how many pigs? 1 pig, so that's $3 plus 94 rabbits <laughs> times 50 cents. And that also adds to 100. And so this is a, just a, a strategy, if you don't have a lot of things to check, of just using a bunch of different for loops nested inside of each other to try a bunch of different pairs, or like triples, or quadruples. As many things as you have, you would have uh, that many nested for loops. All right, so that brings us to the end of our slides. The very last example that I wanted to use uh, shows a do-while loop, and this will be a guess the number game. So. Uh, we're going to make a guess the number game. Guess the number. And the way this works is we're going to ask the user to enter, like, we'll guess a number from 1 to 100, I guess, a random number. We'll make it up. And then we'll ask the user to guess and tell the user whether or not it was too high, too low, or they got it right. Yeah? And this will, uh, this will be the last thing in this lecture. OK, so first we need to find a random number. So here's our strategy. Make a random number between 0 and 100 for the user to guess. Keep asking the user to guess while it's too low, while the guess is too low or too high. And then if the user got it right, we'll, end, we'll stop. All right, so this keep asking is very clearly a while loop, or just some kind of loop. Do something while something is true. That should scream loop in your mind. So let's first make a random number. Uh, from 1 to 100. So int, let's see, we'll call it n equals rand, I guess, 101, because this will give us a number from 1 to 100 because the remainder could be 1 to 100. And we should probably also have a different number each time uh, by seeding the random number generator with the current time, maybe. So now this should work. Uh, all right. Keep asking the user to guess while the guess is too low or too high. So while, but we should also, I mean, the user has to guess at least once. So that whole at least once thing screams do while loop. So do uh, get the guess, right? And to guess. So we'll populate this guess by asking the user enter a number, um, enter your guess, maybe, and then we'll see in that. 
And so now I have a guess to work with. Uh, and we want to keep doing this while the guess is not the same as the number, right? While guess is not equal to the number. And if it is, we'll stop. Because then this loop the condition will be false. Because if it was equal, then it would be false. So if guess is to is smaller than the number that we're trying to guess, we'll see out uh, to low. We'll have to, we'll have to guess higher, right? Something like that. Uh, and then otherwise, maybe they guess too high. Oops. Else if it was bigger, we guess too high. And then else, so if it's not too big and it's not too small, it was exactly the same. We'll say, you got it. And so this is an example of using a do while loop because we'll always ask the user at least once to guess a number. And so while the guess is not equal to a number, we'll keep on iterating and asking the user to keep on guessing. All right, so let's see if I can just put this all together so you can see it. Sure, that works. Guess the number, dash O, guess the number. Oh gosh, what did I do wrong? Uh, Oh, sorry. I kept using number instead of n. I guess let's just name it to number. How about that? Okay, cool. So I guess I mean the optimal strategy here is to guess fifty, right? And then keep on having that search space too low. Oh, sorry. Should have guessed seventy-five. Excuse me. I don't know. Ninety. Eighty-five. Eighty. 76. Okay, so the number was 76, and this is how this game will be played. So feel free to code this up. I'll put all this on the lecture notes and GitHub. Uh, yeah, I think that concludes our first virtual lecture. Thank you for uh, sticking through this with me as I figured out how to do all of this. So I'll see you in the next one.